Chair, Mr. Speaker. There is no doubt that the opioid crisis unfolding right now in our communities, big and small, right across Canada, is nothing short of a national emergency. The suffering and damage this crisis is causing, not just in Vancouver's downtown east side, the epic centre for the crisis, but in Vancouver East and cities across British Columbia and Canada, and it is absolutely devastating. I'm very grateful for the Herculean efforts of first responders, frontline workers, medical practitioners, family members, advocates and activists who have and are continuing to work tirelessly to save lives in the midst of this terrible crisis. Honourable Speaker, people are dying in our communities. Both the City of Vancouver's Medical Health Officer, Dr. Patricia Daly, and the Provincial Medical Health Officer, Dr. Perry Candle, have declared this crisis as a medical health emergency. In fact, this is the first time in the history of British Columbia that a health emergency was declared. It was noted by Dr. David Gerlink, head of the Clinical Pharmacological and Toxicology <laughs> at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre in Toronto, that the number of overdose deaths across Canada vastly outpaced the toll during the 2003 SARS crisis that gripped this country and was declared as an emergency by the Ontario government. He stated, and I quote, 44 people died of SARS. We lose 70 people a week to opioids in Canada, end quote. Still, the Federal Minister of Health has refused to declare this as a national health emergency. From the beginning of 2016 to October 2016, 338 Albertans die from an apparent drug overdose related to opioids. Fentanyl was involved in 193 of them. Two Ontarians die from opioid overdose a day. An average of 79 people die of drug overdoses every year in Montreal. This is not, if this is not a national health emergency, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what is. So today, I'm here once again urging the government to do what is right and what is necessary. Declare a national public health emergency. And let us remember, as we debate Bill 37, people in communities across the country are still dying. Bill C-37 came on the heels of an announcement from the B.C. government who was no longer willing to wait for the federal approval and decided that it would take, quote, the extraordinary measure, end quote, of signing a ministerial order in making the provincial operation of temporary overdose prevention sites legal. For those who want to put up roadblocks for harm reduction initi initiatives, including super supervised injection facilities, I say this. It's been more than a decade since InSight. The first supervised injection facility in North America was established. There has not been one single overdose death in that, in that facility. InSight has saved countless, countless lives. It has reduced the spread of diseases. The evidence is clear and it is unrefutable. Van East led the way, and I am so, so proud of the progressive forces and the movement in our community that care so deeply, that took this issue and drove it until we had the first supervised injection facility in North America. I still recall vividly, Mr. Speaker, the imagery of a thousand crosses planted in Oppenheimer Park in our community, what we call the killing fields. And each one of those cross bared a name, a name of a real person that we know that we love in our community, a daughter, a son, an aunt, an uncle, somebody, somebody's children. And how family and friends came together and we mourned the loss of those preventable deaths. It was a call to action and we drove the issue and eventually insight was established. It's sad to me that despite this irrefutable evidence-based outcome, there are still those who want to block this criti critical health measure. 
They form a government of every step possible to undermine the work of insight. Even after the Supreme Court of Canada's decision, a 9 to 0 decision that ordered the government to exempt insight from persecution, and prosecution, and stated clearly that the government cannot close insight because of its ideology. The Harper government passed Bill C-2, the ill-named Respect for Communities Act, which introduced near insurmountable barriers to opening new supervised injection sites in Canada. The roadblocks have been widely condemned and have no doubt contributed to preventable deaths. Though with more than a year of foot dragging and thousands of overdoses and hundreds of need needless deaths, the Liberal government today is finally bringing in measures to address the ideological relic of the years past. While I support Bill C-37, to be clear, I would much rather that the bill was, was about repealing Bill C-2. But nonetheless, this is a move in the right direction, it's a step forward, so I am here to support it. Bill C-37 has to get through this House, then it has to be sent to committee, and then it has to go to the Senate. It will be some time before this bill passes. So I want to applaud, first of all, my colleague, the member for Vancouver Kingsway, the NDP's critic for health, his attempt to try to get this bill through all stages uh, as quickly as, as possible. Sadly, that proposal was rejected. Many concerned citizens and organizers are so frustrated by the glaring absences of sub substantive action on this that they have felt compelled to act unilaterally with pop-up supervised injection sites. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. This is a testament to those individuals' courage and dedication to saving lives in our community. Let me take a moment and to thank them and to acknowledge the numerous volunteers and activists, the leadership shown by Anne Livingston and the peers at Van Du, Sarah Bly, the former Vancouver Park Board Chair, and many, many others for their incredible dedication and caring. Were it not for their efforts, I can say with confidence that many, many more people would have died. In going forward, Mr. Speaker, as we wait for Bill C-37 become law, what action can be taken to save lives? Let me start with a shout out to all the tireless first responders for their incredible efforts. I, I heard firsthand from firefighters about their experiences in this crisis, particularly those men and women who are in fire hall number two. The incredible overload of calls that came into that hall and the stresses that the firefighters had to face with each and every day, that they have to witness deaths. Imagine that as their work each and every single day. And then, as you know, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't, it is not limited to fire hall number two in my riding. In fact, all the other fire halls in my community across East Van had a increase in cost with respect to overdose challenges and issues. I heard from firefighters who told me that within their own shift that sometimes they would have two or three or four or more calls going out trying to save lives. That's what they're faced with. Imagine the stresses of that, Mr. Speaker. The BC Coalition of Nursing Associations hosted an emergency forum on the nursing response to the opioid crisis. Like so many, they are devastated by this medical health emergency, and they themselves are suffering from stress, trauma, and exhaustion. All first responders, nurses, healthcare workers at emergency rooms, frontline workers with NGOs, they are overextended and they deserve our support. While the Minister of Health has said that they would take action and provide support to first responders, we are still waiting. Let's get on with it, Mr. Yes, Speaker. As well, I want to say that we need to do much more. Other issues uh, as well is that we need to move to a longer term resolution. Real effort needs to be made to provide addiction treatment for some traditional treatment works, for others not so much. And we need to move forward with providing 
uh, treatment that deals with the addiction, including opioid prescription and opioid substitutes. The goal of stabilizing people and getting them away from Ill the illegal market saves lives. We also need to look at the issues around social determinants of health. We need safe, secure, affordable housing. We need to address poverty. We need to look at the issue of breaking that cycle. And we need to address Aboriginal child apprehension, a comprehensive approach so that we can move forward once and for all to save lives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my uh, Honourable Colleague from Vancouver East uh, for our presentation. And I myself uh, have had the opportunity to, uh, to live in Vancouver in the past and uh, to work, uh, in fact, in the Chinatown Legal Clinic, uh, which I believe is part of her particular riding. And uh, I wanted to, uh, to get her uh, a perspective on what this particular bill will particularly mean for her riding. Uh, why it will ultimately be critical in saving lives, because I'm uh, quite familiar with um, uh, the, the substantive problem of, of drug abuse uh, in that particular area. Uh, and I, I do want to also ask a sort of a supplementary question with respect to her continuing call for uh, a, a state of emergency uh, from the uh, Minister of, of Public Health, and why that particular provision would, or that particular declaration would actually grant any additional powers to the Chief Public uh, Health Officer for Vancouver East. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, to answer the last question first, um, well, a declaration of the, uh, for the government uh, of a public uh, health emergency uh, by the federal government would allow for the federal funding uh, and coordination uh, be made available across this country. As well, the creation of these what we call pop-up sites, these temporary safe injection sites as an emergency basis would be facilitated. Right now in our communities, these pop-up sites have occurred and they have proven to save lives. This needs to be mu uh, multiplied across this country. We can model um, actual best practices on how we can save lives and for the federal government to declare a public uh, health emergency would actually allow for that to take place across this country. On the question around um, others in around uh, Van East uh, and particularly those in Chinatown, uh, what are their thoughts around harm reduction? Well, there's been a, a number of different perspectives and some of course are very concerned about it. What we've got to do is really to educate people, not to use fear uh, to trumpet division. And first and foremost, we've got to put this forward. If we can't prevent the death of someone, they will never detox, would they? Dead people don't detox. That's what this is all about and what harm reduction is all about. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. 